story. Now, y'all know it overwhelms me when y'all all talk at once like that. <laughs> I don't think you're going to be wrong. Surely, you, I mean, the, the, if you just paid attention to the words you're saying, you got to get something right. The things that they brought, each part of those represents a portion of Christ's identity. They brought gold, as the song stated, for his kingship. They bought, uh, brought uh, frankincense, uh, which represents prayers and praising, just like the song said. Uh, and they brought uh, myrrh, which is what they used in embalming someone at that point. So they were preparing him for his death from his birth. That's why there's another song that's been written, Born to Die. He came with that in mind. There's something else that has stuck out to me multiple times, but I was reminded of it when we were singing the song a moment ago. How did those, they, they weren't Jews. How did they know what that star meant? What? They weren't Jews, but they read the Jewish Bible, and they knew a king was coming. How many of us would make it to a worship service that it took us approximately two years to get to simply by our knowledge of this book? That is rather convicting to me that these people who were not raised, they, they were Asian. They were from the Far East. Maybe India. But the point is, they knew this book well, and not the one I'm holding, obviously. I'm not that old before you start. But they still knew the Old Testament scriptures well enough that they knew the king was coming. The king of Israel at that moment didn't know the king was coming, but they did. Amen. Let's take a few prayer requests. Everything good to go? Maybe so? Okay. Prayer requests. We got uh, Brother Jeremy in Garmish. Right? Did he make it? Okay. So, uh, Y'all probably saw Joe's greeting from the Parkers, good days, bad days, but let's keep the Parkers in prayer. We want to continue to pray for our country. We have several lost and backslidden friends that we've been praying for. The Lord has answered several of our health requests, but we're going to leave Otis on it because he told me before church that uh, his back was talking to him every time he turned around, so... Uh, anybody else got something they want to add to the prayer list tonight? Um, we have some missing friends at the Holdens who are currently in Peru, um, and they even have an earthquake significant one. Are they in Arequipa, Lima? Um, I, I don't remember the pronunciation. <laughs> it's not Lima. Um, I'm sorry. That's okay. The Lord knows where they are. Yeah. Arequipa is another city like the size of Lima or thereabouts. They're, they're missionaries to the deaf there. And so they're, they're, they're probably a, in a city, though, huh, where there's a are. deaf school. Yes, and there, there's a church there and all of that. Uh, they, they're missing friends and protection for the, from the earthquake that is happening, but also they have a young man there who is um, old enough to be free and he is wanting to join the ministry here. Okay, Dan, I thought I saw your hand, too. Oh, okay. Anybody else? Oh, you're giving me the dab, I see. Anybody else? 
All right, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for uh, the church that's gathered out tonight, Lord. And I know it's a, it's not as cold as it has been, but it's a cool evening, Lord, and dark by 4 o'clock. So uh, thank you for those that came out. And I'm sure some are watching um, by Facebook, Lord, and we'll watch later by YouTube. I pray that you would bless them and do what we could never do, and that's speak to their hearts. But we do pray specifically for Jeremy as he's in garments this week, Lord, and pray for Dan as he drives back and forth to be spotting uh, nearly every day, and for C and Ann as they drive back and forth to Lime School, Lord, that was a wreck two or three times since they've been driving out there, and we just pray that you keep them safe. We do pray that you'd work in <clears throat> Joe's life as he's home, and he's got several friends with health requests that he's praying for, and several people he's praying that would be saved, Lord, so we just pray that you'd continue to encourage him and work in his life, Lord, and we do thank you for uh, the numbers that have been coming out, Lord. We pray that you would continue to glorify yourself in what you're doing here, Lord, and I pray that you keep us all uh, humble to know that it is you and not we that you're just pleased to use us, Lord, and I pray that you would help each of us to keep ourselves in a place where we are usable, Lord. We thank you that you brought Michelle back to us tonight. We know she's been out uh, with various things, Lord. We just thank you that she's back with us. We do pray that you continue to work in David's life and in his mom's life, Lord. And I um, continue to pray that you'd work in uh, Alex's life and Hans's life and Rosalind's life and Thomas and Ralph's lives, Lord, and so many others that we know and are acquainted with, Lord. I know Today, there was a, just a glimmer of an opportunity to witness, Lord, and I pray that you would help us to, to allow you to work in our lives, just like you did in David's. True enough, in, in most of David's life, Lord, he was talking about physical battles, Lord, but we need your help right now in 2021 and soon to be 2022 to teach our hands to war and our fingers to fight, Lord, that we can be used for you. Help us to realize, Lord, that though sometimes we long for the days of old, that you brought us to your kingdom for such a time as this, Lord. And I just pray that you would strengthen us and help us to see what you can do through us as individuals, from the youngest in the room to the oldest in the room. Just show us how you can use us and help us to be nimble and moldable in your hands, Lord. We love you. We pray all these things in Christ's name and for his honor alone. Amen. So Sunday, we started talking about pictures and prophecies of Christ in the Old Testament. I'm going to start with Moses because I don't want to skip the book of Deuteronomy. And he is the main, basically there are two pictures in Deuteronomy. One is Moses, the other is the rock. And frankly, I talked about both of those on Sunday, but I wanted to just kind of review what we talked about uh, Moses. Remember that Moses, like Christ, was born under a Gentile government, right? Christ was born under the Roman government. Moses was born under the Egyptian government. Neither of those are Jews. Neither was raised in his father's house. We know that Christ left the throne of glory to come and be born in a barn of some kind. Some people say it was a cave. We know that stock was kept there. Livestock was kept there. Uh, not the nice paper kind we keep today, but like four-legged, nasty kind. And he was laid in a manger, which is an old English word for a trough where the animals eat. And he was raised in Joseph's house, and Joseph was not his father. Uh, Moses was raised in a little better house than, than our Lord was because he was raised in the Pharaoh's house. Uh, in the lives of both, there was an edict. Now, that's a big $2 word. What is an edict? Uh, to put it in an American mindset, there was an executive order to kill all babies under two years of age. All male babies under two years of age. So both of them were spared by God Almighty from this edict or executive order to kill all these male children. Um, both were raised by the daughter of a kingly family. I've not preached through the, the uh, lineage of Christ in, in some time, but Mary was a descendant of David. So Christ is the seed, the son of David, all right? Uh, 
Moses was raised by the Pharaoh's daughter. Uh, Moses was with the Lord 40 years, right? On the wilderness, was with him 40 years. Moses' life, somebody tell me about how old Moses was when he died. McKaylee, how old was Moses when he died? McKaylee says, I don't know, man. What you call on me? Moses was 120. He spent about 40 years in Pharaoh's house. And then he spent 40 years on the backside of the wilderness, which is actually where he came to know God in a real and personal way. All right. And then he spent 40 years serving God. Now, Jesus spent eternity with God because he is God. Amen. But with the fasting and praying, he spent 40 days with the Lord. Um, they both endured murmuring. Now, what does that mean? If somebody's murmuring against you, what does that mean? Gossiping. The Israelites said of Moses, even though Moses listened to the Almighty God, he was afraid like a lot of you and a lot of me. Uh, we're often afraid that God can't use us, right? So Moses was afraid God couldn't use him because, well, he was... He had this problem of speech, I, and most people believe it was stuttering. Um, but he actually, you know, God sent Aaron with him. But you showed me a time Aaron spoke to the Pharaoh. Most of the time, we're afraid God can't use us, but when we get in it, we know that we can say what God called us to say, and we'd usually rather say it ourselves than somebody else. But when he led the people free, the people said over and over, look, he brought us out of Pharaoh's house just to bring us out here in the wilderness to die. Wish we were back in slavery, at least we'd live. Sounds like a lot of people around the world today with all the craziness we're facing, but I won't go down that rabbit trail. The Pharisees and Sadducees called Christ the son of Beelzebub, which is like calling him Satan's son. Um... They tried to stone him two or three times. They said he had a devil. They said he was the devil, etc. Uh, both had direct contact with God. The Bible says of Moses, God said of Moses, it's recorded in Scripture that God said of Moses, I will speak with Moses as a man doth with his friend face to face. When Moses came off the mountain, the Israelites were afraid of him because he'd been so close to God, his face glowed. All right? um, the sea obeyed both of them. Both of them fed multitudes. You know Jesus took you know, five loaves and two fishes, but Otis, I always like to put it in something I can understand because when I think of a fish, you know, I'm thinking, boy, he had a big old fish, right? It'd still be a miracle, right, if he took a fish this side, two fish this side and fed 5,000 people. But he had basically two sardines and five biscuits, all right? Sardines and fish about like this. He took that and fed 5,000. How did Moses feed the multitudes? Two ways. How did he feed the multitudes? He prayed for manna. He prayed for manna. God, the manna was out there every day. What's the other way? They actually complained about eating heavenly bread. And he prayed for quail. And the quail came in, and all they had to do was gather them up. Now... Down south, Garrett, a lot of people rave over eating dove. Can I tell you, I've had dove about six or eight times in my life, and maybe one of them, it was worth a second bite. And I like dark meat. Dove is dark meat. Maybe just the people who cooked it for me cooked it to death. I don't know, but I've never really savored it. But quail, that's like eating all white meat, well, mostly all white meat. But anyway, it's pretty good grub being in the desert and have quail just come in for you to get. Um, Moses led the people from a physical bondage. The Lord led us from spiritual bondage. Moses spoke for God. Jesus was God. They both began a new era or a new dispensation uh, previous to that. Uh, what Moses began what's generally called the dispensation of the law, and they both reappeared after death. Okay? Where did Moses reappear after death?
get furious. With Elijah in the Revelation, but he also appeared where? When Jesus was there. All the disciples saw, saw it. Peter said, hey, we ought to build three tabernacles. One for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for the Lord. Okay? But he will appear, according to the book of Revelation. It doesn't call his name in Revelation, but we generally, most people believe it to be Moses and Elijah because of the things that is recorded in Scripture that Moses and Elijah did and what they do in the book of Revelation. But anyway, so that's that. Now, Joshua. There are two, three, I guess, pictures of uh, Christ in Joshua. Uh, one of which I'm just going to tell you from memory. One of which we're going to look up. Well, probably two of which. What does the word Joshua mean? What's the word Joshua mean? If you pronounced it in Hebrew, it would be Yahshua or Yoshua. Jesus in Greek is Yeshua. So basically the vowel is just slightly different between Joshua and Jesus. And both names mean Savior. His name is equivalent to Jesus. It means he led his people out. He won the victories that Moses and the law couldn't win. Pretty amazing. Uh, and that word Joshua is used couple of different times in scripture it, it bears to it's kind of a rabbit trail from it but it bears to it brings to mind the story of the help me lord the story of eli eli was the high priest when samuel was a boy and eli was just a fat old man that was losing his sight and hearing and his sons were ridiculously worldly when you and your wife came to worship, God had a plan to feed the priest. The priest were to take a flesh hook and throw it on the altar, and whatever it pulled back was their meal for the day. There were there were there were sacrifices daily. They didn't want to just take whatever the hook brought to them. They would see you standing in line with your sacrifice. Now well, I, I want that I, I want that tenderloin. I want the best cuts, of which were really for God. They didn't, and they could have got it. Maybe the hook brings it to them, but they wanted it in advance. They also took liberties with the worshiping ladies that they shouldn't have. Pretty bad. So there's sin, and sinful people even still today. Uh, you were talking about one earlier, Michaela. Sinful people try to obligate God to give them a victory. So they went out into victory. Uh, went out into battle, and uh, they lost. So they took the Ark of the Covenant with them into battle. Not only did they lose, but the Philistines got the Ark of the Covenant, and both of Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were killed. And uh, one of their wives had a baby uh, born at the same time she got the news that the, the men were killed, and she named the baby Ichabod. Now, growing up, I only knew Ichabod from Ichabod Crane and the Headless Horseman. But Ichabod means the glory of the Lord hath departed. The ark represented the glory of the Lord, and it was now in some other country. When God, I, I, I cannot take the time to tell you the whole story, but when God sent that ark back, it came to rest in the field of Joshua, or the field of salvation. The other thing is the scarlet cord is a picture of Christ because he's going to shed his blood. And so uh, Rahab, the old harlot that obviously came to know the Lord and saved the spies who went into Jericho, uh, she was to hang out that scarlet cord. And when all the walls came down, the wall where she lived did not come down. She was protected. That The, the blood protects you. But look in chapter 5, which is just before the battle with Jericho. Look in verses 13 and 14. We're talking about pictures. It's Wednesday night, so um, maybe it's not terribly exciting, uh, but doctrinally it is to see. Uh, what we're going to see here in Joshua chapter 5 is what is called a Christophanes. 
or a pre-Bethlehem appearance of Christ. If you look in verses 13 and 14, it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. So here's a guy standing beside him that's got his sword out ready for battle. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? Are you on my side or are you on the side of the Jericho people? And he, this man with the sword drawn, said, Nay, but as the captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, Who saith my Lord and what saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Well, that's the same thing God said to Moses, uh, you know, 40 or 50 years before at this point. Um, this is a picture of Christ. Christ is not just, there are people out there who insult our Christ and say, well, you know, what kind of guy just, just dies? I mean, you know, they want some kind of leader they can follow after who's fighting and all this. But in dying, he won the battle. And Christ is no, no weakling. He is God Almighty who loved us enough to pay for our salvation, pay a debt we couldn't pay. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you two more, and then we're going to stop. The book of Judges. Well, there's some great stories in there, right? There's the story of Samson, the story of Gideon, the story of Deborah. I love Deborah. Deborah was a judge, and God told her to tell this fella to go fight. And the fella said, I'll go fight if you go with me. And she said, which is pretty true, right? She said, okay, I'll go with you, but I'm going to get all the glory because you're supposed to do this on your own. All right? She's a pretty factual person. But time would fail us to talk about all of the different judges there. But here's the deal. The judges were deliverers. Christ is our deliverer. There's some lessons we can learn from the judges that we can get a hold to as Christians. What, what happened with God's people, God has no grandchildren. Judges covers generations. God has no grandchildren. So a, a people is thoroughly right with God, and boy, they're excited. And then as time goes on, maybe the next generation, well, they're sort of right with God, and they believe on God, and they're saved, but they're, they're, they're not fervent like their parents. And you go a little further in the next generation, well, they're just, they're just in sin. And then they're in bondage to sin. And then they realize, hey, you know those, those that, that what, our, what our dad said, what our granddad said, what our great granddad said. And they call out to God. God sends a revival, and we're back with a fervent people again. And that circle, I think, is still going on today. And we're somewhere between in sin and really truly calling out for revival. But the thing we can get from it, Garrett, is that can happen to you and I. The question is, in my life, obviously, it can't be generations long. It could be years long, and it could be moments long. I'm right with God. I'm a little complacent. Oh, I start to dabble in sin. I'm all off in it. I ask God to revive me, and he does. But the fact of the matter is, you and I could take that and make it be decades long, or we can make it be minutes long. It's on us. I'll give you one more, and we won't take the time to read Ruth. We've been through it in Sunday school, but Boaz is a picture of Christ. He's called the kinsman redeemer. There was a nearer kinsman, Lorelai. There was somebody that was closer related to, to Naomi and thereby to Ruth who could have paid the debt, but he wasn't willing to pay the debt. The, the, the qualifications of a redeemer is he has to be qualified, which Christ is qualified, and he has to be willing, and he has to be able. And just like Boaz met all of those requirements for Naomi and Ruth, Jesus meets all those requirements for us. Notice this. I've got other things written down, but I feel like I should stop right there. 
Notice this, though. Where was, was Jesus crucified, in town or out of town? Mm -hmm. He went outside the gate to pay for your salvation. Boaz and the nearer kinsmen went outside the gate. And I don't really understand all of the Jewish traditions of the one giving the other his shoe. But basically, when the nearer kinsman gave him his shoe, he's saying, it should be mine, but I'm giving it to you. Jesus went outside the gate to accomplish what the law, the nearer kinsman, could not accomplish. The Jews tried to make the law into a works-based religion that produced salvation. But God's plan was always on salvation based on relation that produces good work. All throughout the Old Testament, I'll tell you again, Christ is concealed in the Old Testament, is revealed in the New Testament. And I'm going to try to continue through this uh, right up until Christmas time as far as looking at... I feel like we need to look at the Bible from every angle that we can because so many people say that the Bible is dated and that we shouldn't worry about it. And so many people say today that we should unhook from the Old Testament. There is much truth in the Old Testament. And the New Testament, guys, tells us that the Old Testament was written for our admonition. To admonish is to teach and direct and correct. So we have to look at it all. But I'm going to 